to all of you and i welcome you all to the live webinar series uh, these webinars are an initiative of professor chintamani sir who is a renowned surgeon and an exemplary teacher and every sunday uh, there are many important topics which sir takes and are discussed in detail with all of you and it's an interactive webinar where all, all the questions that are posted by the students are also taken by sir and discussed in detail so before we begin today's webinar which is on a very important and an interesting topic diagnostic laparoscopy in surgery i now uh, welcome professor chintamani sir to the live webinar series so very good morning to morning you. to you good morning thank you thank you like everything it's a pleasure <coughs> excuse me good morning to morning. all all and, uh, and uh, i hope, I hope you had a good sound sleep sleep last, last night, night so we'll, we'll have, have some, some discussion, discussion first of all uh, Thank, Thank you, you Suthi, for putting, putting it together. together. And, and also, also a word about, about the PG master classes that we're going to have for three days on the lines of what I do in school and also in the Gurukul uh, master classes. So do get in quickly those who want to because the space would be limited and we may have to refuse some people at the end. And don't bank upon the YouTube recording of webinars because that's not what they're meant for. The whole purpose is to make them interactive and make use of it, right? So, uh, without much ado, uh, if you could kindly once again indicate that you're able to see the slides and uh, me clearly, I will then start because I may not then have your feedback regarding whether you were able to hear or not hear or see or not see because that's one thing which happens every time. Towards the end, somebody mentions I could neither see nor could I hear. Well, that would be, uh, you know, I'm muted. Okay. Right. So I think we start because uh, more majority have no problem. So uh, for those who have to adjust to it, they please do do so quickly because we are just starting. Well, why diagnostic laparoscopy? Because many a time you ask for certain topics. Uh, it's what you want, but uh, I take a call on this based on what you need. So it's important for all of us to uh, stick to some understanding that most of these are important topics for you and not that you can ever learn diagnostic laparoscopy theoretically, but uh, it will be useful if you can put it all together today and you can have more of interactive um, session, more of interactive discussion rather than anything else. Now, uh, a word about what is diagnostic laparoscopy because you hear this so frequently it's something you hear almost every day we do staging laparoscopy we do diagnostic laparoscopy we try to you know explain it uh, in all our management of malignancies uh, that we would like to do a diagnostic laparoscopy before we proceed and the whole idea is based on the logic that you will pick up something which you missed out on CT scan or other imaging modalities or where the non-invasive modalities have given you some kind of a background you want to improve upon it. Now classically, please understand the definition of diagnostic laparoscopy and I'm not, the, I'm not a very great fan of parrot type learning and you should understand what it means. Well, first thing, please mark every word as I say. It is naturally a diagnostic procedure which may be diagnosis plus intervention in the form of some biopsy. It's not treatment. And mind you, it will require documentation. You can't just do and hope that it will be recorded somewhere. You need to record it yourself. And uh, so you need to have... Uh, the the whole therefore done to make a diagnosis is what you would want to be considered as a diagnostic laparoscopy if you just put one port all right very common mistake and you say I have done my diagnostic laparoscopy, it will be a wrong statement. That is called celioscopy or just laparoscopy. You can always put in a scope. So, first thing first, understand what does it mean? Because if you don't, there'll be confusion all the time. So I want to fix it before I move on. 
a few things which are important. The second thing is when you are actually doing the diagnostic laparoscopy or any laparoscopy that's umbilicus you either put a sublumbilical port or you put a supraumbilical port that's optional both are equally good and they have their indications and facility lab and convenience etc where you put the second port would depend on what you're trying to see if you're going below that is below the umbilicus you put a port either second port either in the right left cosa McBurney's point or on the corresponding point on the left side if you're doing it in the upper quadrant, you put it one either in the uh, right hypochondrium or in the left hypochondrium. A lot of people prefer to do it in the left hypochondrium if you're going for some definitive surgery later on in the form of duodenal ulcer perforation repair using this. Or if they're doing it for the sake of, uh, you know, so that they can use the same ports for doing the uh, surgery later on. So then a lot of them like to use the left one because you then have the long stick you know you have uh, the freedom to work and act so I hope I made it clear at least two ports and the third important so first was two ports mandatory okay second is both are held by the surgeon who's doing it now it's similar to um, you playing tennis and the ball disappears in the bush and it's getting dark so what do you do you take a torch to search for it if you're doing that with the torch you may not be able to see it so what do you do in the other hand you take a stick or uh, your racket or something else or if you're playing playing golf and the golf ball is so both should be done by you if you hand over the torch to your friend then he is doing the search you're not doing the search because he'll move it anywhere. So remember that. So both with the surgeon. Third, mandatory to document. If you're recording it, you can say, I don't have a facility in my laparoscope, uh, my system. So you can record it from outside, but it has to be recorded and documented. Very, very important. Right? <clears throat> and then something very, very 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 important I hope you are paying attention as I speak now you should not take a biopsy as soon as you see a lesion why the pneumoperitoneum has been created which is kept at a particular pressure I'll come back to this biopsy point later on and you will rem remember that it's important you can do it under local anesthesia, you can do it under GN, or you can do it under regional anesthesia. These are options. But naturally, if you're doing it under local anesthesia, you'll struggle. The patient will have stretching pain. So the pneumoperitoneum pressure has to be less than 8. Otherwise, under GA, it's the same, which you have for usual laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is what you people are familiar with. Or regional anesthesia, you can achieve the same. I mean, you have the same advantage in regional and general anesthesia. So remember, if you're asked a question, what will be the pressure in a local anesthesia laparoscopy, diagnostic laparoscopy? It's less than 8. And 12 for general laparoscopy. So remember that. Now, if the pressure is 12 and you take a biopsy, while you're still going to carry on with that pressure for some time, you're likely to cause implantation and the very old concept of which I'll discuss with you including my own publication on the port site um, uh, port site uh, issues where they can be port site metastasis or port site tuberculosis or many things can happen so don't take a biopsy now there because you'll create a raw surface when you've finished everything, you can leave a mark there. You can come back and take a biopsy. And that's the last procedure you do. Another very practical tip, which a lot of people don't follow and therefore they get into this trouble. For me, the laparoscopy is mostly for diagnostic purposes in malignancies and sometimes for surgery, resection, say LARs or APRs, and for colectomies. So there you have decided what you're going to do. You already have a diagnosis. So you just walk through the whole thing and you come back. 
take a biopsy and you're out if you think it's not resectable if you're going for resection then you it's a long procedure anyway now when you are going in for diagnostic laparoscopy keep everything ready i mean don't wait for the anesthetist to say don't touch the patient unless i have anesthetized because you can always have your uh, command in the ot by declaring that there is a reason why i'm going you know the longer a patient stays under anesthesia more nitrogen will collect in the bowel that is why you get very distended bowels if you have delayed your getting inside now the earlier you create the pneumoperitoneum because pneumoperitoneum will create pressure and the bowel won't be able to distend them then you'll have non distended bowel otherwise surgery can be very messy especially you're working in the lower part pelvic surgery aprs they can be a challenge because what happens usually is you allow the anesthetist to put the patient under anesthesia then you start arranging your stuff you start getting your trolley sorted then you get your people sorted you bullshit a few here and there then you try to look for tubes then you start looking for yourself finally and when you find yourself you have already allowed 15 to 20 minutes of anesthesia time what does that mean it means nothing special the only thing is bowel would be distended with nitrogen you know why because nitrogen is what you have in your bowel and that you all know it when you pass it from the other end that it stinks like hell and that that's that's nitrogen so remember that don't allow it to accumulate inside the bowel which will cause distension of the bowel and make your surgery difficult so i hope i made those points clear the biopsy which i was leaving here yes here biopsy i'll sure take it at the end okay some people when are going in for a very known diagnosis i'm not talking about gynecologists here because they often uh, have endometriosis to diagnose when you do laparoscopy for some time you can achieve particular hemorrhages in the peritoneum which look exactly like endometriosis so you can be confused so for endometriosis you go in first do the job and come out and usually it's all confined to the lower end well i'm talking about surgery today so i'll stick to that so i've given you the port placement now I've finalized it now. That's my patient lying supine. And importantly, this is the incision. If I'm going to the lower side, I'll prefer the incision above. If I'm going to the upper side, I'll prefer the incision below. Why? Common sense, no rocket science. I want to get a longer distance to work at. You know? And then if I'm doing the dual neural ulcer fixation, I'll enter from here for the second port. If I'm doing something on the left side, like spleen, it'll be from this side. So depending upon where you're going to operate, it's basically surgery for intelligent people. And that's why surgeons are, are taken as mostly the best planning and the most intelligent people in the system. And there is a reason for that. Because the, the whole idea is to allow it to have freedom of movement. Otherwise, when you eventually have to plan more ports, I don't need to tell you about the concept of a baseball which forms like this if you have this concept in mind all ports should figure in and a lot of people follow the rule of 60 degree all that is a general laparoscopy now I'm talking about diagnostic laparoscopy as a routine so I'm repeating it it's mandatory to have the clinical diagnosis imaging based two ports at minimum otherwise it won't be diagnostic laparoscopy it will be celioscopy or or peritoneoscopy or whatever what have you or simply laparoscopy both are to be held by the surgeon at least when searching now when you found a golf ball in the bush then you can give the torch to your friend to fix it there then you can remove it so when you are intervening you can pass on one stick to the other i'll share it with some pictures with you so that you'll be able to understand what i'm trying to say always document as you go along keep noting it down the best is to record it so that you can sit down in peace and assess it biopsy at the end for reasons i've already told you with the pneumoperitoneum and the chimney effect which was earlier believed to be the cause for port side metastasis has some role it is not established but you can it makes sense that if there is a pressure which is keeping things from going in one direction it can cause port sight but it's not established evidence does, doesn't say it happens you can do it under local anesthesia need a lower pressure that is eight 
below under GA and regional anesthesia. So very rarely you do under G regional. Regional is done for usually the pelvic part, pelvic surgery. You don't do laparoscopic cholecystectomies, although some people do it. It's not recommended. Preferred is general anesthesia, and we should stick to the same protocol. So we'll rely on general anesthesia, and then pressures can be built in. So that is the first part which I wanted to discuss with you, and I move on. Now, I already defined it, but uh, just to complete the job uh, as to how should you put it down when you are answering, say, in your exam or you're answering to somebody who is uh, basically very much a documental type. Minimal access surgery, which allows visual examination and documentation, because if you don't do this, it is incomplete. Of intra abdominal organs in order to detect an underlying pathology. I didn't say anything different here, I've already said it. Now, imaging must be done beforehand. And you can also add imaging to laparoscopy by adding laparoscopic assisted ultrasound or lap US. So you can make it laparoscopic uh, extension. I mean, you can use it as an arm. And that's what it means. Now that's diagnostic laparoscopy ultrasound, which I have just touched here so that we don't have to go far. It can be used to evaluate deep organ parts, not necessarily for not necessarily for the superficial parts, but the deep part. It's not and whatever is not amenable to inspection. And it also allows for the therapeutic intervention, like a lab ultrasound guided FNA. So you can use this for for doing the need for right now So the diagnosis is clear and what do you do is also clear now a little bit of history There are many names that come forward with Claim that they were the fathers of laparoscopy. I think Jacobius was the one who saw it first time some people said tubercular patient, it was an ascites, but I also have a reference that it was a malignant patient. So what did he do? He put in a simple cystoscope to look inside. And in fact, he did not have a cystoscope also. He used a, a simple uh, proctoscope and then he threw the light in. So there are various variations, but he is labeled, as, he is taken as one person who probably did it for the first time. And it is it is quite, um, remarkable that somebody thought about it. That's its history. So you can see that he's seeing through the same opening and uh, those days we didn't have a video uh, of the uh, video recording of the procedure and this was faster. Okay, that's fine. Learn. So this is the first one that happened and in fact he could find out that a sciatic fluid is looking different. There were some tubercles or metastatic lesions. They could not make a diagnosis but this was a diagnostic laparoscopy attempted for the first time so we can give him the credit and uh, well this is not to let you know that uh, it changed history for somebody but that's me, yours truly way 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 back because i got my thesis as diagnostic laparoscopy in malignancies and now you can see i have used this port to reach where i had to reach and then i can help my, my assistant can help me after i fixed it to take a biopsy this is a old alligator forceps It's long back and we had to learn laparoscopy at that time from the gynecologists. We did not do it at all. No surgeon knew it. And when I got it as a thesis, I was wondering who's going to teach me to, how to do it because actually the learning was tough. So I learned it from the gynecologists. And gynecologists US use it very commonly in their, their lap ligations, etc. So they're very familiar. Well, there are many things we learned over the time. This is just a you know, you'll see the equipment also that is available. This is when I was training, and uh, you can see the limitations. You have to peep in 
So it, it they, they, they were all peeping that time and everybody would make fun of you as the people who just go and put their scope wherever they try to see something which probably only they see mm -hmm. and most of the time the appendix would look like fallopian tube fallopian tube would look like appendix and we'll struggle to find out and once we found out the tiger surgeon would open up the abdomen and say i could see it straight away you wasted my time so i had to plead with people that diagnostic laparoscopy has a role it so i picked up mostly malignancies which were terminal and uh, it really was beneficial. I did take lab, lab, liver biopsies that time, but it's always a challenge. You can see there's no diathermy attachment. Taking a biopsy, never attach a diathermy because it will destroy the tissue. So it has to be taken either with a cold scissors or nowadays with harmonic scalpel. Don't destroy it. Most people I've seen, they cut it with diathermy. It's no point taking that biopsy because the tissue would be all dead. So some pictures just to share with you, just to lighten you. That's yours truly and it's the other view of the same and you can see that this is my dear friend Rawat who is assisting me he was the only guy who would stay back to do it with me so once I had fixed it I gave it to him and I'll make him make him clip it as I fixed it so two ports are mandatory if you don't have two ports you cannot do diagnostic laparoscopy and it should not be done that is what is the message here and that you can recognize is me if you can't my fault now this is the equipment that we had those days which is very basic you should be familiar with it this was the equipment carbon dioxide cylinder is right here small amount and that's the sister scope connector which we had to use when we started and you can see that I have not yet used the second port this is the previous picture this is the first picture and I'm trying to do a complete diagnostic laparoscopy. Then I'll go to the other side and see it on this side. And the other port is already in place. So important to know that these are old times and we have moved on from there. Now the indications. Now where all you think we require it. There are SAGE's guidelines. I think the slides would overlap like every time because of the internet connection maybe. The SAGE's guidelines for acute conditions. So what are those guidelines? We need to know. Diagnostic laparoscopy. Remember, guidelines are the best way to proceed in your career. <clears throat> As surgeons, learn to follow guidelines, and there is no place for eminence based practice. They are useful mentors, use them, <clears throat> but follow what is evidence based. And a good teacher would always tell you what is evidence-based and when it is not evidence-based he would explain that I have done it this way You find out the evidence now many a times you would find that there will be evidence to that because wisdom has a place in our training Sages guidelines for acute conditions. This is what I'm going to discuss Because they they are the guidelines that we all follow sorry and Okay and we will find there are three indications and you must remember each one of them you see after this lecture you'll be able to not only perform it you'll also be able to write about it discuss about it and this would be a very basic and a very important topic that you should all know that's why i took it i could have easily taken any onco topic and we moved on acute abdomen very important role we'll discuss it trauma very 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 important and of course, now there is a case for ICU laparoscopy, where patient cannot be shifted. Patient is on the bedside. The patient is on the ICU bed. You can put in a scope even through a local anesthesia. Patient is under ICU care anyway. Then you can do some diagnostic laparoscopy, including biopsies. So these are the three indications in acute scenarios as per the CHS guidelines and you should stick to them. Now for the chronic conditions, chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis. It's common in the gynecology setup, so you know that. But there are lots of women who come to you in your OPD and I know you as residents see a lot of these patients with a non-specific 
abdominal pain and sap non specific abdominal pain their abdominal cripples their pain just doesn't settle we don't know what is the cause they keep coming back and back till such time that you declare them hysterical or psychosomatic which will be a wrong way to approach it they should be at least subjected to a diagnostic laparoscopy and especially the tubes and the uterine uterus related uh, pathologies can be picked up very easily liver diseases including cirrhosis infertility cryptocardism where you know you can find the testis when you reach the deep rings which you can see testis is, which is lying within two centimeters of the deep ring you can do the extension that is you can do lap assisted or laparoscopic Ocuropexy. It can be just an extension of the same procedure. So it is possible, but you must make sure by adding ultrasound to laparoscopy that it is viable testis. <coughs> Take that consent from the patient. I'm doing a diagnostic laparoscopy, and if I think your testis is not viable, I may have to remove it. Or take a consent for lapros uh, the laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy, lap laparoscopic ocuropexy. Because if you're very close to the ring, you can do it. But if it's far, it may not be possible. Then it's only diagnostic. And we all know it's a gold standard. Why is it a gold standard? See MRI. Suppose, suppose it's a child. He won't cooperate in that claustrophobic space. CT, the child. Ultrasound, maybe. And we know that ultrasound can be done in positioning. Feet and feet up down so that you can see the testes can descend to whatever level it can and you can find out the important thing is adding doppler to ultrasound whenever you do to see the viability and sometimes you can trace the testicular artery to the testes from the aorta you can trace the testicular artery and reach the testes the other chronic condition include pancreatitis acute pancreatitis also but chronic pancreatitis also and also conditions like uh, non-specific pain abdomen I'm repeating that but that's that's important that's what I'm repeating so then we have for trauma this is for trauma there is a level 1 to level 3 evidence what does that mean remember level 1 evidence is when you have randomized robust randomized control trials and you've done comparison and you have meta-analysis it's very difficult to get level one evidence for trauma very easily but it's very useful if you are uh, dealing with a hemodynamically stable patient don't do it in a hemodynamically unstable patient even in the ICU setting it's only for the hemodynamically stable patients please understand that it's very very important Naturally, it can prevent unnecessary laparotomies. Sometimes, why? How will it prevent unnecessary laparotomy? You know, we do e fast, we do fast, right? And we find out there's blood. Okay? We also find out that the liver is bled. But how do you know whether it's bleeding now? So it can, it could have bled and stopped. You don't, may not need to do anything. Or it could be a bleeding liver. Then you know what you have to do. So it can prevent unnecessary laparotomies. Can reduce the morbidity and costs, but naturally, it can show you retroperitoneal hematomas whether they're expanding or not. If they're not expanding, why open up? You will actually create a, you'll take away the tamponade effect of the abdomen. So it is not very useful if it's a non-expanding. So expanding versus non-expanding, and of course, renal injuries. How? How would you see a retroperitoneal structure in an intraperitoneal through a laparoscope? A challenge. Then you can put it the other way, in the retroperitoneal space, which is done. So you can do that, or you have an indirect evidence, or you can exclude other injuries. Very isolated renal injuries are not so common. Isolated renal injuries would would be uh, extremely rare. You look for, you'll find spleen or gut or other injuries happening at the same time. So we need to be. Uh, intelligent enough to know when we are doing it and certainly as i said you will not do it in hemodynamically stable uh, unstable patients so when i'm saying level one two three evidence which means we don't know when it's ideal but generally hemodynamically stable patient 
CT equivocal because you'll also do CT in the algorithm. What do you have in the ATLS? You have CT now. It's non-invasive, gives you the same information. Then don't put in a scope unnecessarily. And just because you have a scope, you shouldn't put it everywhere. That's called hammer and nail syndrome. And what is hammer and nail syndrome? When you have a hammer, everybody looks like a nail to you. And you try to put a scope wherever you can. This is what you see happening today. Right? For, for the right breast from the left breast, then the left breast to the right breast, then for the thyroid from the axilla, you keep, you keep doing things, you know, just because you have a scope. But if you don't use it intelligently, it is going to waste, waste the resources. It's going to achieve nothing. So be intelligent enough, wise enough, whatever you watch around is for education. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll translate it into. You watch many people doing monkey ropes, don't you? You see people climbing a 40 story building. You don't start doing it next day because you'll have accident. And that's why they mentioned in very small letters below, not to be repeated in public one, but they're doing it. Okay. So what you need to learn is not to ape. When you use the word ape, it is basically referring to apes only. So don't copy it like a monkey does because um, this is where it's very, very important. So whatever I'm telling you, I'm qualifying with, with evidence or I'm telling you where I like it, where I don't like it. It's very simple. So I can do it in acute conditions, chronic conditions, trauma. Where would it come into place? I think it will come into place when you've done a CT and it's equivocal and patient is hemodynamically stable. You can argue why why bother that patient is going to stabilize. But this is where it has a role. You can do a good wash, get the blood out. Right? And a very common question is asked in the in you, you know when you're appearing for some fancy exams, say you go beyond your uh, routine MS or DNB, uh, or uh, you are having a good MS or DNB exam because examination depends on many factors. How do you calculate what is the what is the blood loss when you put in a scope? With the patient in a supine position, look for the deep ring. If the blood is up to the level of deep ring, filled that is, it's about three liters. Approximately, but if you suck it and put it in the jar, you can measure it anyway. But if you're asked, you should know it. And say if it is half, so it's roughly about 1.5 liters. It's a rough estimate. So for those clever guys who want to talk about it, it's a good thing to talk about. Okay, uh, three liters if it goes up to deep ring. This is the posterior wall. They just filled up the brim and come to the deep ring. Deep rings are both sides. Where you can see the cord going in, you know that, of course. And um, it's lateral and all those triangles come into business. Triangle of doom and a trapezoid of disaster and what have you, everything there. So you will find that blood is filled up. Well, that gives you a rough estimate and you accordingly can arrange for blood. And don't just stick to it. Some of you will have you will just stick to it. Don't stick to it. I'm just giving you a reference. You can always suck it out, measure it. It is not tough. Okay. And patient would be definitely uh, stable or unstable. And it will also have a role, according to me, in seeing the expansion of retroperitoneal hematoma. It's an important point. If it's not expanding, no retroperitoneal hematoma, which is non expanding. And naturally, I'm doing diagnostic laparoscopy. What does it mean? Hemodynamically, patient is stable. So you can amount to calling it fiddling with nature. But if at all there is a 50-50 doubt or you are confused and you want to be sure about it, it will part form a part of the algorithm, but not routinely. If it's non-expanding, you come out and stay safe. We have at least seen it. But what have you done more than that? You've documented it. A salient point that most people ignore. And diagnostic laparoscopy is incomplete without documentation. Very, very important. So, is there any role in the ICU, which I mentioned? Very much. Now, any situation where the patient has abdominal pain and tenderness, but no indication for laparotomy. So, what have I done here? 
short of laparotomy. There's a lot of collection inside. You tried your pigtails. It is not draining out. So it can be a good peritoneal lavage. Washing and placing a drain appropriately and of appropriate size where you want to put it. So it has a role. If there is a suspicion of an intra-abdominal pathology in critically ill patients without a need for transfer to war, and you can do it bedside, it's an advantage. Allows for an uninterrupted, uninterrupted treatment of an ICU patient. So you may do it uninterrupted. Patient doesn't have to go anywhere. Easier said than done. I'm giving those indications. Definitely with everything in my mind. Um, the positives and the negatives. The, the do's and don'ts. But patient has to be. I'm touching it again. Hemodynamically stable. Whether you're doing under local or under GA. But some out of pneumoperitoneum is actually needed. Some out of the pneumoperitoneum is needed. to make it into a safe procedure and patient has to be hemodynamically stable see the other problem with the patient under local anesthesia is he's breathing so the diaphragm also causes raising rising in the intra-abdominal pressure and then you also raise the pressure so you'll have respiratory embarrassment besides pain which will produce tachycardia tachypnea as it is so you know when a person is breathing there is an increased intra-abdominal pressure with each, each each time he breathes and you also raised pressure in the abdomen this may cause trouble therefore you need to therefore general anesthesia is better in local anesthesia you must have seen gynecologists clipping the uh, fallopian tubes they don't do too much of um, you know dissection around and they do for endometriosis taking a biopsy i mean little procedures can be done so i'm not saying that cannot be done but you should know the limitations now the the technique which is what you will be wondering what do i do in the icu you see the point is sorry the point is you first of all got to have a diagnosis why are you doing it must be very seriously discussed and don't just take a decision my scope is waiting to do something so let's put it into this abdomen that's not what we want to do unexplained sepsis you are not finding the source what is suspected is sepsis patient is in systemic inflammatory response syndrome or MODG. they've got different names now but names don't change it basically sepsis with a patient that is not recovering you know the patient is not getting better you have sepsis and do you know one very famous uh, aphorism please remember pus somewhere pus nowhere pus under the diaphragm whisper this is for all of you to understand now how would you find it out sometimes you cannot see it but although most of sounds will be able to show it but if you want to drain it nicely and put a you know uh, drain there and carry out a lavage then we can possibly do it uh, with diagnostic laparoscopy so important and I'm sure you all agree on that now we have made the diagnosis and we are clear on that there is no obvious indication for laparotomy there is pain abdomen you don't think it's peritonitis where <laughs> diagnostic laparoscopy is not good well suspicion of intra-abdominal pathology in critically ill patients without a need for transfer to OR which I have already discussed with you now the technique now mostly you will be dealing with lots of adhesions and and the most common reason is failure is due to severe adhesions otherwise you can do it that side but it can be adhesions and since you are using very low pressure you may not be able to get a good pneumoperitoneum so the most common reason for failure if you're asked are adhesions and we should be conscious of it so local anesthesia with sedation, occasionally paralytics, intubation may be required. If they're intubated, then you don't need any of these. And you need a portable laparoscopic cart, which is available. Most laparoscopic carts today are portable, but they should be able to go to the ICU and should be available there. Cut down technique and virus needle from virgin area umbilical port. So do not use commonly the open or the Hassan techniques here. 
we need to create a good pneumoperitoneum and palmer point is a very good idea that is uh, say about four to five centimeters below the left uh, costal margin in the mid clavicular line because that's where if at all you damage it, something minor to stomach or something can manage it all escapes it so a caution pressure less than 15 is I'll call it 8 to 15 you don't raise it to compromise but if you can get relaxation then you can make it like any like laparoscopy and uh, the the it's called cut down technique because you can you can use a cutting in you keep cutting till you open up the peritoneum so you make an open technique that's what I was trying to say the other name for that is cut down also you can cut keep cutting down so you create that opening and then put in a scope simple or you can use various needle but you need to be careful but various needle should go from the virgin area because there are chances of injury in an open technique you are more likely to be safe that is why it is mentioned what are the contraindications for doing it patients unable to tolerate pneumo naturally if you can't tolerate pneumo you're too sick to be found out as to what you're suffering from the cardiac status pulmonary status they're all at risk so we won't take it these are not the cases where you would like to do it so pneumoperitoneum if you cannot do pneumoperitoneum you can't do diagnostic laparoscopy and uh, it is applicable to icu patients as much as it is applicable to other patients they're so sick that there is no realistic chance of survival even if the treatable cause is found very rarely people would recommend this in a very sick patient if the patient is too sick even for a haircut then and if you want to do a diagnostic laparoscopy it's it will be taken as a um, malpractice frankly because patient was too sick to undergo because we still stick to the same norm primum non no share above all do no harm the ob obvious indication for surgical intervention like bowel obstruction or perforated risk is why are you putting in a scope then so that's a contraindication would be relative and of course distended abdomen clinically suspected to be abdominal compartment syndrome so the contraindications would be if i have to put it down as one two three would be what one poor performance status i put it in one word which you can answer pneumo not feasible three obvious indications for surgery laparotomy you have a perforation you have a uh, intestinal obstruction and four is abdominal compartment syndrome which means patient has got such a high pressure that you would kill him by raising the pressure they need decompression and laparoscopy is not a decompression you will need a decompressive laparotomy how do you do it now the technique of diagnostic laparoscopy partly i've covered but i'll cover it first port is at the subimplical subimplical or palmar point which i have discussed you can also have supra if you're going to the lower part supine patient and remember when i'm going to see the pelvis what will be the direction of the patient? Trendelenburg. Because I want to go and see this. Bowel should come down. And when I'm seeing the upper part, what will the position? Reverse Trendelenburg. And they are both 30 degrees. In one picture, I explained both. 30 degree telescope is preferred. Patient is supine. If you have 30 degree telescope, that is better. But the question is to get used to using it. The second port is in the right iliac fossa or left iliac fossa, as I've just described already. Now, surgeon holds both the ports initially, which I mentioned. Mandatory. He should be doing with both hands. Once he has found where the golf ball is, then he can hand over. The torch part, that is the laparoscope. And if you're doing a procedure, you will hand over to your assistant. Acidic fluid of pus to be collected and should be sent for needful as soon as you see it. It should go for the culture sensitivity. No acid is in malignancy. 
200 ml of saline washings if you don't find any aseptic fluid and some malignancy what do i do i do what is called a peritoneal wash how much saline is used 200 ml and these washings are then inspected and examined we follow a clockwise approach starting with pelvis and that is 15 to 30 degree trend line box so how do i do it i'll show it again first of all umbilical or supra umbilical a palmer point these are the places to enter open or various needle technique the patient is 30 degree foot and up that is trend and work position if i am trying to see the pelvis up to cecum and maybe ascending colon this is the position i want and back lower down but above the if i'm going above then i'll change the position to 30 degree reverse tendon so that i can see the liver the gallbladder the left lobe of liver spleen and part of the descending colon properly hepatic flexure properly for this i need this position and for looking at the pelvis i need this position i hope that is clear the other thing you will start with i'm repeating what i've already said with two ports the other port would be as i mentioned in the beginning would be the left iliac fossa or the right iliac fossa for the lower part right hypochondrium or left hypochondrium for the upper part easy to remember if i'm operating here this port is going to be useful so i'll use this if i have to go to operate here i'll use this port for working so they are they are available to you in that form now there are uh, there is a um, world uh, association of laparoscopic surgeons and sages guidelines for the clockwise approach which is here and i hope you can see it because it has shifted uh, i'll try and get you the upper part first and i get the lower part then it's not difficult so we start with the lower part first which is what is it is very faint i think i'll blow it up so watch the slide rather than anything else i start with the cecum because that will come in my view as soon as i'm in and before i see the cecum what will i see the contents immediately below the point where i entered so that i've not damaged it see, that's one thing you need to see whenever you put in a scope look for where you entered it from, or the first port site or the virus needle site is that clear so cecum then i'll see the ascending colon patient is getting 15 degree reverse tendon lymph. then i'll see the liver which lobe right lobe and in between i'll see what the hepatic flexure then i'll go right down to right up to the falciform ligament now what do i do here now i'll have to get the scope out don't negotiate it with the scope and where do i puncture now it depends on where i want to go further so i would have put my port here which will help me negotiate my movements or here depending on where which side you're going this is for this side this is for this side if i want to see here go here and this is what i was trying to say then you withdraw and you come to the left side of the falciform ligament you will see the left lobe of liver you'll see the spleen You'll see the splenic flexure now in between, just exactly here. Now, if you don't do reverse tendon and bug, you won't see the colon properly. Transverse colon certainly will go very where it'll get lost. So we'll see the entire colon. Now, and then the descending colon, sigmoid colon. Now the position changes for the pelvis. I'll get into the pelvis in surgical scenario at the end. And for this, we need a position with the trend and a position of 30 degree. So the bowel all moves upwards, lower down, right? And you're able to see the 
rectum. The sigmoid won't move. The sigmoid can be seen. Rectum can be seen. Pelvic organs in a lady, you can see the uterus and all the ligaments which are suspensory. Round ligament, you can see. You can see the infundibulo pelvic ligament. They are all seen in laparoscopy very clearly. Now, when you are doing it, sometimes there is a problem in putting the small bowel back so that you are able to see it. This is this is what this clock method was, which you probably you're not able to see clearly. If you want to see it again, see come ascending colon, hepatic flexure, liver, right lobe. That's the midline falciform. Then left lobe of liver. Then uh, the spleen, then the left colon, pelvic cavity, and cecum are almost at the same level. So you can go deeper to see more. I hope that is clear. I tried to put the guideline also with it, although this is what you would we would naturally follow. Remember certain things. Now, if the bowel is occupying the pelvis and you're not able to see, also what happens during APR or rectopexy when people do that, they want the small bowel up. Up means towards the head. So what has happened is the patient is already in the trenal end position, should fall down. But what is holding it from coming down is usually the sacral promontory. And you don't have to hold the bowel and bring it. It's a wrong practice. Even if you get a bowel holding forceps, never hold the bowel. Hold the mesenteric fat. Don't hold the bowel. You'll cause damage. And there's nothing like an atraumatic instrument anywhere. You've not yet made it. Any grip is traumatic. So don't, don't be misled into believing that. So what do we do? You just swipe it. And swipe it proximal to sacral promontory. It won't come back. You just have to swipe it up and as it falls proximal to the sacral promontory it won't go down now you can do the pelvic assessment accurately take the scrapings take the biopsy depending upon what you're doing now let's take the important scenario which you have in surgery acute abdominal pain I have mentioned here non-specific abdominal pain also which is seen in ladies as I mentioned how do you define it? Even this is a definition. People have got it all objectified. It's not your gut feeling that that will decide it. Non-specific acute abdominal pain less than seven days duration, which is where the diagnosis remains uncertain. Not because you're useless, but because the symptoms are and signs are not so clear. After baseline investigation, everything you've done. It's not, you will not do diagnostic laparoscopy before doing the imaging imaging is the standard of care please don't get me wrong don't put a scope as i'm saying but i have seen it happen all around so that's what i'm saying the rational is to prove to prevent treatment delay all oh, that's all and to unnecessarily make them into um, you know candidates for persistent abdominal pain and abdominal cripples as we call them Diagnostic laparoscopy versus apical appendicitis is the only level one evidence. You must put in a scope in these cases. Exclude meekles, exclude a gynecological cause which may not need surgery. Exclude any cause which may not. Exclude Michel Mers, which is a mid cycle pain due to rupture of follicles, which causes a collection of blood, and also the signs appear. So, our sign and everything appears, which I've discussed in acute abdomen video so you can also watch that that will help but there is a level one evidence that you should look for appendicitis there's something which can be fixed with laparoscope also same time but it's useful to put in a scope very very useful now there is this mention in a publication of mine which we deliberately included to now this is fallen maybe time to below Port side tuberculosis following laparoscopic cholecystectomy. We had this patient way back in 2004 and 5 when we were struggling with port side metastasis as a concept. 
this was probably the first two cases of port side tuberculosis reported and this was a case where uh, this was my own patient with a sub umbilical port kept on discharging for a long time and we didn't know why it is not healing then we got the culture done it was mycobacterium and we went into literature to look as to why does it happen now this also took us to why does it happen in the uh, you know in malignancy and that was what was believed at that point of time what they believed was that it is uh, the chimney effect which meant if you have a sudden decompression of per, uh, pneumoperitoneum like the cells just fly and they lodge at a raw area which I told you in the beginning also carbon dioxide we don't know nobody has ruled it out they don't know evidence there's no evidence and it just stopped people from doing laparoscopic surgery for cancers in the initial phases now there's enough evidence to show if you take care especially the delivery of the specimen in a sterile bag which was not there earlier this was possibly the reason when you're delivering the specimen raw through a raw surface you can implant cells and the patient gave no history of tuberculosis mind you and on att the patient responded very well that's why we had published it it is in journal of royal society of medicine which is called tropical doctor you can always follow this uh, presentation in the uh, on the pubmed also this is a publication and after that many people have reported now but this was in the beginning and the other so there for two theories one was chimney effect most people believe that it's no longer the case yes direct contamination because they found again our own publication isolated colostomy site recurrences in patients undergoing APR now what we found was at the colostomy site the malignancy developed so the specimen handling even through a raw surface which is not laparoscopy can all, can cause this so that is what proves that no it's not chimney effect mostly but it's a good practice to release your pneumoperitone gradually and believe that it could be an effect and the direct contamination has to be avoided by delivering in in a bag what are the limitations of diagnostic laparoscopy very important in especially abdominal pain it is superior to observation for non-specific abdominal pain but available evidence is mixed one doesn't swear by it it is preferable certainly to exploit it laparotomy. I mean this is not a case where you want to put a negative laparotomy as a protocol so it is better than a negative laparotomy put in a scope if you're opening up anyway and in appropriately selected patients as uh, as would be understood and we know that it will have its limitations uh, if there is a surgery which is happening anyway and the expertise is available there's a great C recommendation uh, where you can actually um, find some evidence that this is recommended so in a non-specific abdominal pain it is possible in a non-specific abdominal pain you can actually do a diagnostic laparoscopy short of diagnostic laparotomy which makes sense and also um, you can avoid intervention in some cases certainly level one evidence for when the doubt is appendicitis even if it is chronic appendicitis it can give you a diagnosis important now let's talk about cancer where diagnostic or the staging laparoscopy is mandatory now you know, you know that there are certain conditions the uh, the lymphomas where you do what staging laparotomies used to be done earlier we are doing staging laparoscopy now and what do you find in lymphomas is you know you see an oak tree it falls from top so inverted oak tree droppings as they call it what happens is when you will when you will check the finding you send peritoneum they start forming and then they drop inside so they're more here than here so they drop from here 
that's called a oak tree droppings are defined in lymphomas classical how would you differentiate a metastatic disease from tuberculosis very commonly asked question tuberculosis versus metastasis remember metastasis is shiny tuberculosis is dull and muddy both can have ascites if it is hemorrhagic it goes in favor of malignancy if it's turbid classical straw then it is tubercular so this is how you differentiate the two it's just a take home for you the role is very clear especially we know that staging in esophageal cancer because if you don't have the stomach available the tube cannot be formed or if the nodes in the celiac group or the nodes along the cardia I mean you have the stations of the stomach involved in an upper one-third cancer of the esophagus it will be taken as a metastatic disease because you have moved on to a non-regional uh, metastasis in gastric cancer it is mandatory pancreatic variable is mandatory because you can avoid leprotomy in a non resectable case and how do you do that you know that CT has a limitation below a particular size they keep arguing one centimeter or five millimeter but I'm just giving a size with the best serial sectioning uh, right you can miss on CT so what do you do you put in a scope which really magnifies it and you can take a biopsy and abandon the leprotomy do a non-surgical treatment you are dealing with a stage 4 disease which is a big take mind you the morbidity of surgery and leprotomy see the problem with these patients is if you have seen patients of cancer stomach especially you opened up you've done some procedure you've not done any procedure also they start throwing ascites now and the abdominal the everything opens up and it's very very difficult to manage that malignant ascites which becomes intractable now so putting in a scope can be really really beneficial here it's mandatory to stage we call it staging and in periemplary cancer we know that it's mandatory just before and this is a very favorite question that I ask in all PG exams. Also, MCH, I always ask this question. What do you do when the patient is on the table? They keep talking. And we put the finger in, then we go carize, then we do look for this. They forget the first step. It is mandatory to uh, to go for the. It's fine. To go for the uh, mandatory to go for diagnostic laparoscopy in most of these patients. It can save a unnecessary laparotomy with its morbidity now the of course in liver cancers which include primary as well as liver metastasis or primary you can make here i would like to uh, share very importantly how to do the biopsy in these cases is very very important now remember you have localized a metastasis Please don't take a biopsy during the diagnostic laparoscopy, which I've already told you. But when taking a biopsy, use a cold scissors to cut the tissue. I prefer it even over harmonic because no tissue should be damaged. You must get the biopsy right. The best is cold scissors. And then you can attach diathermy and fulgurate to stop the bleeding, which happens subsequently. Or you can use a harmonic which does both but you must keep low in harmonic it won't matter because it is a vibratory tool so it won't matter so that's why people can use it now in doing this sometimes in the liver especially you may confuse it with him and it's very very important mind you man if you do a biopsy from him and it bleeds like hell hell and you would be in trouble you would not know what to do so exclude that especially in liver and how do you exclude that? Well, first of all, it's color. I already told you about how the metastasis would look. And secondly, you can do the compressibility test here also. So with a with your left hand, try to with the you holding a I mean using your left hand effectively as that's why I said to compress to see 
If it is compressible, no biopsy. No biopsy. Because then it is going to bleed like mad, even if it is something you think is metastatic still. And metastasis is shiny. It just shows itself. Right? So that's how you must make sure that you're not dealing with uh, hemangioma when you're taking a biopsy. In bleeding tract cancer, of course, you can find out, you can stage it. This is for staging. Colorectal cancer, very useful because you can actually stage and sometimes perform a metastatectomy. You can do the whole procedure laparoscopically also. Single stage versus two stage. Single versus two stage, which I discussed in one of my videos on liver resections in colorectal cancers. But what you can do is uh, a metastatectomy is possible in the same sitting. But the principles are just the same. You do it at the end. You don't start with it. Don't, don't let the pneumoperitoneum disturb your cells. It should not be thrown around. And importantly, in lymphoma, which I've already covered, the uh, oat groove appearance or the orchard of the, the oat orchard appearance, something of that kind, where you find it dropping from above. If you've seen the oat tree, you would, you'll see that in England very commonly. They start draw, dropping from up. The droppings come like this. That's why the name. And you have a staging for Hodgkin's anyway. When you look for infradiaphragmatic, what groups, spleen, liver, can do biopsy at the same time. You can take the static fluid out for culture, or you can do peritoneal scrapings or washes with 200 ml of CLI, which I've already covered. In colorectal cancer, take care of where the metastasis is, record it, cold scissors, remove it, fulgurate it later. Don't just uh, you know, uh, use diathermy. The other place where, which I didn't mention was in pancreatitis, people put into do necrosectomy or putting in a drain there and sometimes to just rule out the bowel ischemia. There are other non-invasive methods, so I therefore did not highlight it. You can take that in question answer. Now taking one by one, the important ones, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, especially to look out where it is uh, resectable or not. The occult metastatic disease or unsuspected locally advanced disease in patients with resectable disease based on the preoperative imaging prior to laparotomy. For assessment, also, if the patient has been put on new agent chemotherapy, these are the indications. I'm giving you the indications on, on a, in a format so that you can use it to answer in the exam. Now, or otherwise to learn as you're talking. I mean, everything is not exam oriented. Everything is it's basically learning. And I, whenever I'm using the word exam, because some people just wake up that time. So it, just to keep those people alert, uh, because we have become totally exam oriented zombies now. But I'm sure it's going to change. And then selection of palliative treatment, you can choose as to whether you are going to do a palliation or you're going to resect. These are the indications. So occult metastasis or unsuspected locally advanced disease. You didn't suspect it. CT didn't give you a picture. You go for it. Therefore, go for it each time. For assessment, before you go for new agent chemotherapy so that you can assess the response. <clears throat> a lot of us would be happy with CECT. For selection for palliative treatment, naturally, that I've covered. So I think that part is done. The other indications are they already are locally advanced. So we look for a no metastatic disease or not, so that you can plan a palliation. Because you know what is the basic requirement for palliation in pancreatic cancer? At least four months of survival should be assumed before you do bypasses, because there's no point treating the patient with aggressive treatment when the patient is not going to live that long. And there, that's where it can be used for. What are the contraindications in malignancy? I've taken each step, each entity, and I've given you indications and contraindications. Known metastatic disease, naturally, why should you do it? You've done a PET scan, you've done contrast and CT, there are metastases, why put in a scope? This is only done by greedy practitioners who want to make money out of it, which we should not do. Don't malpractice in, ever in life, because it may give you a short-term gain for a huge long-term loss. 
and any intelligent person would be looking at a long term gain even if you're looking at gains and losses in life it's almost impossible to quantify gains and also losses in life what you gain you may not know what is your gain may not be in anybody else's gain so learn to grow uh, with with your uh, conscious intact otherwise the person who would succeed would not be the same person that is working for it and then the whole purpose is lost if the patient cannot tolerate pneumoperitoneum or the performance state is less than 60 i'll put multiple additions prior operations there will be a contraindication false negatives are a major problem and they will cause uh, you to be reassured and going for unnecessary laparotomy which will be negative and you'll add to the cost you know you put in a scope and you find it's looking like a very neat and good cancer you go in with all said and done diagnostic laparoscopy would also be operator dependent unless you're extremely extremely experienced you can miss the procedure related complications are obvious and consider only after high resolution imaging basically you should have done a high resolution imaging essentially the cts good cts which would not be replaceable anyway now i'm taking one by one pancreatic covered t3 t4 lesions without evidence of lymph node or distant metastasis in high quality pre imaging that's indication in gastric cancer so what are the indications in gastric cancer straightforward t3 t4 no confusion without evidence of lymph node or distant metastasis and high quality imaging but if you decided to do laparotomy put in a scope you have surprises in t1 and t2 stages also this is an old old statement i'm just qualifying the statement for you what are the absolute and relative contraindications in cancer stomach if there is obstruction there is gastric outer obstruction you're putting in a scope you already know the stage it'll be late right or there is hemorrhage or perforation and needs palliative surgery you're wasting time there's no point diagnosing or over diagnosing it you're going in for surgery anyway you have to go in for surgery because this is they are both emergencies obstruction and hemorrhage and perforation so what are you trying to find out we are going to operate these patients anyway and this is not a, a curative surgery we are going in for so there is no problem very early stage cancer should proceed to surgical section without staging laparoscopy laparoscopy it's an older way to look at it nccn has improved it but with guard i've already covered that you know you the whole idea is you don't expect metastasis in these patients but to call it early stage you've done very very high resolution imaging which is rarely done you must have very thin sections in multi detector ct scan so it's very 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 important i included this to to take care of what you read sometime and you may try to extrapolate don't do that in an early gastric cancer you don't expect metastasis but you have to exclude it by doing metastatic workup in the metastatic workup if you don't have a high resolution and a good quality contrast and ct scan then you may miss out and you don't want to miss out that's the whole idea and if the patient has lots of additions expected additions that is basically in previous surgery you won't like to do that and finally we are going to take an important uh, i mean um, statement in all of them tailoring it to patient cancer center some centers don't have the facility of very high resolution imaging in that case we should not we should not be fussy now the esophageal cancers i've taken pancreatic cancer gastric cancer and esophageal cancer now these are potential patients for curative resection which is based on i mean you've taken a patient who's going in for surgery first of all you know 20 percent would be resected less than that now based on negative preoperative staging imaging that is again you're relying on that for lymph node or distant metastasis procedure can be used for enteral feeding that is you will at least if nothing else you can do feeding just not you're already inside you can do that and contraindications are known metastatic disease and intra abdominal lesions so indication contraindication more or less similar 
but repeating it there is a potential patient for curative resection you don't mess it up basically based on high quality preoperative staging imaging procedures for both lymph nodes and metastasis I'm highlighting it then if you think you can do enteral feeding through this in any case you're putting in a scope so you can do a diagnostic laparoscopy in a known metastatic disease and in intraabdominal adhesions the contraindication would be based on the same logic I'm just going to come to the conclusion of it now uh, colorectal cancers are a very important ones that's why I kept it resectable liver metastasis but with no evidence of extra hepatic disease you know that we take pulmonary also these days but extra hepatic disease is taken as non resectable you know in lung also solitary metastasis can be resectable mind you i already covered metastatic exam which you can do the contraindications are patient is known extra hepatic metastasis because you're not going to achieve much if it's in the lungs you can do vats all right but you can't put a scope there so diagnostic or staging would not be effective there that's the contraindication right now I've included all of them so that you don't have to struggle to find it I put them all together what is the rationale for hepatic tumors the prognosis is in hepat especially primary now in HCC may be improved with appropriate selection of treatment which is based on accurate assessment of size number and location important it will help you plan your surgery non therapeutic laparotomy associated with morbidity and also prevented by detection of unresectable disease by you can pick up pick up an unresectable disease and so before proceeding to laparotomy do a diagnostic laparoscopy which you do in all of them as that's what i'm suggesting and then you can add a laparoscopic ultrasound to find deeper tumors which can actually guide you about uh, the feasibility of your surgery you can you can see that lap ultrasound may be more useful here since the peritoneal disease is uncommon so what is common you look for a metastasis here add ultrasound you find one here add ultrasound you may find one here so what is resectable becomes a non resectable one then your treatment will be anyway palliation which is surgery for colorectal cancer but you won't touch it or you can adopt the embolization which is what will be guided by this or if it is a primary tumor right you have a primary tumor to see the extent confined to one lobe one segment distributed or deep one also there how much resection will be done do i have the reserve so it will help me plan for both so very useful especially in colorectal cancers it will also tell you about the colorectal cancer itself we are not just looking at liver extent resectability peritoneal meds all of them you can pick up biliary tract tumors is it mandatory in gallbladder cancers answer is yes 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 where it's one tube cancer where surgery may not give you a good outcome if you're dealing with a metastatic disease so you should exclude it and regardless of what ct you do it's a good practice because they grow very quickly and they disseminate cholangiocarcinoma is more locally invasive decreasing the yield because they they are locally invasive so you won't be able to see much known or suspected gb cancer without evidence of resectable or metastatic disease these are the indications stage 2 or 2 t2 or t3 higher cholangiocarcinoma without evidence of unresectable or metastatic disease on imaging so we are highlighting everywhere what a good preoperative imaging and there is no shortcut for that you just want to exclude a metastatic disease so that you can work at resection because gallbladder doesn't give you a lot of lot of opportunity later on it's a very very aggressive cancer lymphoma special techniques something i am covering it up i didn't want to leave any opportunity for you to look around you can simply finish it 
mainly in Hodgkin's lymphoma as the exact extent of disease and impact on treatment course you know that lab ultrasound to search for hepatic lesions very important that changes the stage splenectomy with removal of organ intact or lymph node sampling of iliac portal mesenteric and other lymph nodes you can do lymph node excision if you think it is abnormal and you can get a biopsy staging both which I mentioned in the beginning also. The lymphoma would be one good place to do it. And like I mentioned, it will be a useful place for looking for the O3 where the peritoneum is. This is where the lesions happen and then they drop down like this involving the bowel and other places. With that I think I'll conclude it because there is no end to it but importantly remember some salient features before I conclude one is diagnostic laparoscopy is about visualization documentation and minimal intervention with minimum of two ports both held in the surgeon's hand who stands on the left side of the supine patient. Assistant, the mirror image. Sometimes, especially in gynecological procedures, you put the patient in lithotomy from the very beginning. Then one can stand, the assistant can stand in between the legs. That is possible. For pelvic procedures or below umbilicus, I'll put it. You need a reverse and you need a Trendelenburg position, I beg your pardon. And for the ones above, we use a reverse Trendelenburg position. We follow the clockwise sages or the SALS recommendations. We should take a Localize the bi biopsy site, but biopsy at the end. If you're doing it under local anesthesia, pressure should be less than 8. GA, it should be, can go 12 to 15. Can be done in trauma, when you can estimate the blood loss by looking at the deep rings. If it is up to the level of deep rings, it is about 3 liters. It's filled up the brim. Okay, in malignancies, you can do staging in most cancers, but only after the imaging is equivocal, and that means the best imaging methods. In any case, before laparotomy, you can put in a scope. When you don't find peritoneal mets or you don't find situs, you can push into an enamel of saline, take them as washings, and put them to test. By and large, this would be the diagnostic laparoscopy, starting with cecum, ascending colon, hepatic flexure, right lobe of liver coming out, going beyond the falciform ligament, left lobe of liver, spleen. He pet left splenic flexure, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then we go down into the pelvis. That's a circle we usually follow. Now, I think with that we can conclude it. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take.
Bhagyashree. Yeah, the first question is from Bhagyashree about the ideal angles. I think you've written an, uh, angles. angles. Yes. So they say 60 degrees, which have, prevents the cluttering of instruments. It's variable. So I'll call it 40 to 60 degrees. And keep that angle so that vision and the instruments don't fight with each other. Next. If there are any more questions, please post them in the. Sir, so, uh, uh, Dr. Shantanu, please repeat tuberculosis versus malignancy fluid appearance. That's a good question. Can you? I don't know if you, if you can share the screen with my slide. Can you? Yes. They're able to see. Okay. Yes. Fluid in a situs would be straw colored. In malignancy, it will be hemorrhagic. So even it, it can be straw like, but there will be hemorrhagic tint. Tinge, sorry. Hemorrhagic tinge in it. So hemorrhagic on gross look. But after that, you'll have to always examine because you can have straw colored, which is basically exudate. Both are exudates, no? They have more proteins, more than 3.5 gram, I think. Specific gravity, which is more than 1015. Now, this can be seen in both. But then you look at the cells, RBCs and malignant cells. Malignant cells would be bizarre with the NC ratio, which is more, and the nucleoli are sharp and visible. So that's how we'll differentiate it. Um, there are no questions. Yeah, I hope you are all there because uh, if there are no questions, then yeah. Sir, Doctor Sanjay, patients in ICU are critically ill. Can these patients take diagnostic laparoscopy? Sanjay, I, I hope you were listening. The indications in these patients. I've already described that, so I hope you are not joined. You are not joined. The contraindication to doing um, diagnostic laparoscopy in ICU is seriously ill patient. I have mentioned that hemodynamically stable patient. So if they're hemodynamically unstable, you won't take. So usually these patients are under inotropic. Uh, yeah. Inotropes. So uh, should we therefore uh, we'll take them as hemodynamically unstable only? Yeah. If you are on, if somebody is on inotropes, he's hemodynamically unstable. And actually, why I wanted to say hemodynamically unstable was uh, because you should not kill the patient with your pneumoperitoneum so their respiration also should be well controlled so unless the patient is stable which I've already described in one of the slides that um, I think you he probably didn't hear so that's what he's mentioned the patients are critically ill so these patients can take up for DL indications indication in these patients are only if first if the patient is hemodynamically unstable there's no role you should not do it that's the answer you can do it under local anesthesia but then you need to have some pressure inside so keep very low pressure very rarely you can do that but it's not indicated then you don't need to do it so dr ashish asking why are only colorectal cancers associated with isolated hepatic metastasis considered for metastatectomy unlike other intra-abdominal malignancies you see uh, 70 percent of blood flow to the liver is portal and portal drains the large bowel right pay attention if you ask a question you should un and at the end mention that you understood see right side is predominantly in the lesion and left also the portal blood goes in a particular format and then it divides the, radic the radicals and it goes this way so they by portal blood metastasis travel by portal blood the live of the oxygenated blood that is hepatic artery so if you ask the question uh, the metastasis metastasis live of the hepatic artery blood but they travel by portal blood so since ultimately eventually it will be the radical which is going to deliver so it will be one spot that is why they are isolated you don't get the showering as you would get in an arterial travel so it's like telling you that you travel by a kacha road but you live in a fancy home 
So like countryside sometimes. So the road approach road is the same, Bullock Cart Road, but where you live is a fancy five star accommodation. Now the travel is slow and it'll lead there only. So you'll have an isolated metastasis. That's the reason. Sir, uh, Dr. Shantanu asking role of laparoscopy or sequence of checking organs in, in cups. Of cups. That's a very good question. That's where it's indicated. Now, the, it'll depend where the metastasis is. I forgot to mention about the small bowel walk at the end. But I wanted to give more time for discussion and since you've asked, I'll follow the same clock. And then the pelvis and pouch of Douglas for deposits, bloomer shelf for Krukenbergs, everything I'll see in this process. In addition to this, I'll do small bowel walk, which is not done by holding the bowel. I'm repeating, you hold the mesenteric fat and you go from dj to ileocecal junction then ascending colon flexure transverse colon descending colon and down and when you're looking basically you're looking for a primary you already have a metastasis so if the metastasis is in the liver if you're talking about a, when you're saying cups mostly it's liver The diagnostic laparoscopy pattern does not change. In addition, you do the bowel walk, which you do in diagnostic laparoscopy also. But if once you've found a pathology, a lot of people abandon it here, which should not be abandoned. And a bowel walk has to be done very gently. That's what I wanted to emphasize. So, Dr. Aftabs, uh, in ICU, what extra can we expect apart from subdaptal pelvic abscess? Pelvic abscess. Stress perforation of diurnal ulcer, stress perforation of gastric ulcers. In a patient on chemotherapy, immunosuppression, bowel perforation. You can have spontaneous rupture of a pre existing abscess anywhere in the organ. So, all this can happen. We can see more than. Just subdiaphragmatic collection. That's a good question again. So bowel ischemia also? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Ischemia of the bowel, which I missed. Well, I think that's very, very important. Thank you, Sukruti. That's an ICU. Very commonly you find in patients on uh, cardiac treatment. They can have emboli, which can be showered into the gut. You can actually form, find small bowel ischemia very important finding and you can also see whether it's arterial or venous so that's also additional and more suddenly i remembered many acute conditions like you may have appendicitis precipitating you may have mesenteric lymph adenitis you may have diverticulitis pre-existing diverticulum say meekles was there broad based it can get infected, perforate, or diverticulitis is a very common manifestation. You can have a stress bleed. You can have obscure GI hemorrhage, which you can find out with multiple clamp technique. These are, and you can find out sometimes, sometimes I've seen it. Oh, yes. Good question. It precipitated something, then Sukriti added. Volvulus intersusception happening in an ICU patient because they're bedridden for a long time and constipated especially diabetics and you may actually make a diagnosis in these cases although if there is an intestinal obstruction we don't allow decumen diagnostic laparoscopy because you can precipitate perforation but in in early scenarios it can pick up those surprises many other surprises you can pick up there was a diagnosis that was missed earlier many many things I hope that answers it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, Shantanu is asking, can you discuss complications of pneumoperitoneum and when to abandon laparoscopy during procedure? Well, pneumo, uh, don't ask me what is copy book. You know the problems in pneumoperitoneum. It can cause respiratory problems, right? But the most important one is air embolism. So I'll take the one which is important. Rest. So many things can happen, right? 
you can have diaphragmatic uh, you know restriction of movement so respiratory failure is one take hypnia i mean how would the anesthetist tell you he will say in air embolism the saturation drops and he keeps looking at you what are you doing do something about it and that's when you put the patient in what is called as durant position which position you abandon the laparoscopy the patient is kept head down tilted to the left because head down so that the air can go up to the feet not to the brain air ascends up and secondly in this position the ostia of the coronaries are blocked so it doesn't get into the heart also so we put the patient in durand position sometimes there is excessive bleeding due to carbon dioxide but that's not that's please don't take it as an important part but importantly the air embolism uh, the low pressures which will happen because of you know features of abdominal compartment syndrome type of picture so that's where you need to abandon what is the second part of the question so when to abandon laparoscopy yeah just so this is when you abandon it so dr choudhry astra is asking in abdominal compartment patient uh, can we go by palmers and decompress by suction no because it doesn't work no suction works for abdominal compartment syndrome no drain works for abdominal compartment syndrome only answer is de compressive laparotomy i am very clear i have already covered it in past and no drain works i am assuring you and de compressive laparotomy should be preceded by a lytic cocktail to prevent death due to reperfusion injury what is a lytic cocktail it's a combination of combination of a liter of saline mannitol and soda bicarb yes because with the with the pressures going down the circulation improves the lactic acid circulates all over and it can cause damage so we need to give soda bicarb for that there is flanking circulation pooling which leads to pre renal failure give mannitol for dialysis and saline for again the hypovolemic shock that can happen so that's there is nothing that works except decompressive laparotomy so dr anand is asking any role in pseudo colonic obstruction there is a role but uh, it's it will qualify as obstruction so intestinal obstruction is a doubtful indication in most cases can be done but just can be done i am not recommending it most people don't want to do it it is basically uh, uh, to because you know what is pseudo obstruction you have a large bowel dilatation for no reason and even if you find a reason what are you going to do you nothing you there so you may do an ileostomy that's what a lot of people do they may do a colostomy etc sigmoid etc it has a role you're doing laparotomy and put in a scope but important problem is with a distended bowel you may not puncture the bowel that's what is the complication of putting in trocars or the new needles so there are no more questions is there are no more questions i am repeating i just give you i mean i think um, so kriti has already circulated the the details of the pg master class it is like every time that i do it so there's nothing different here you need to put in uh, your ppts early need to register early and remember it is not registration is free because we don't make money out of uh, learning and teaching that's the principle why i established guru gurukul the gurukul group is not about don't don't take it as a pg or a, or a coaching class which is where you people are you know seeing most often it's a teaching i do i have just expanded my classroom because some of my students are all over the world they get back to me that why do you stop this with many people want to have to be part of it we are joined by people from andaman sri lakshadweep from other places pakistan they are all welcome to be part of it everybody is welcome to this class no money to be charged but that doesn't make it less important because we have got a feedback that when it's available you people don't care for it that's your problem register quickly and uh, we'll stop it quickly because we must have presentations we have enough people who have already volunteered but we would want most people to volunteer isn't it so that you can enjoy being part of it three days of active teaching will happen and i promise you it will it's, it's going to be i mean we'll not put the recordings just like that it will come out in a book don't expect it to be put on youtube which we do all the time 
because it's not going to be possible to put that kind of a stuff a lot of stuff into uh, the YouTube so don't miss it that's my suggestion we're not short of people we, we're all flowing yeah, <laughs> so you need to be extremely extremely clever and quick at that if there's no more question I think I'll we'll close it here so yes, yeah so you can make the announcement regarding your uh, you know PPTs that they should submit Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Although it's a lockdown period, but it proved to be an advantage for all of us, sir, because uh, we can get taught by you. And uh, there are so many important lessons that uh, that we never read, and we don't, we are not taught about these uh, these uh, topics. And you're taking them um, every Sunday to teach us. So it is a pleasure. Thank you, Sukriti. It's a pleasure all the time. And all of you must appreciate that a lot of effort goes into this. So when you're writing to her, please make it a point that it's about something important, asking for something, because indirectly you're writing to me. It's as good as that. So importantly, value the effort and um, make the most of it. But at the same time, feel welcome. For me, it's a pleasure. All of you are my students, wherever you are. And I have a very special place for my students and my patients. And like I said, it's not a monetary exercise. There is no money involved here. It's a simple state for our teaching. You should learn with the same clear, pure heart as we are trying to pass on to you. Hopefully, it is going to benefit you. Hopefully, you're enjoying it. If you can if you can mention yes in the block or in the group that you all heard it all along and you're clear on everything, then I'll close it. Yes, after you'll keep getting taught. Don't worry. Yes, sir. Not at all. You're all my students. Uh, God bless you all. May you grow big. May you grow wise. And importantly, may you contribute to the growth. The best way to uh, make the use of what I share with you, both information and ignorance, is to share with more people and put it to use in your practice. I'll be more than happy that you put it to your patients and doctor still is a very special person and I believe surgeon is a very very exceptional person you're all very exceptional leaders of the future so don't get bogged down by negative days people can't pull you down all the very best God bless you and see you in large numbers in the Gurukul ACS con which is we did it in, in January I think January we did now we, we did scope in February now we were to do it in mid-year mid-term of the year we thought we'll do it in May so that if anyone has any exam coming, he'll be benefited. So it's with all of you in mind. We are going to cover up all regions. Please send your uh, preference to present. Yes. You'll be able to present from where you are, the PPTs, etc. The details Sukriti will, give, will pass on. Thank you, Sukriti, Thank for you putting so it all together each time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. So we are looking forward to more such webinars with sir and also a PG Masterclass for three days. Thank you, sir. Thank you everybody for joining.